Hello everyone and welcome to our second day of Biodiversity and Cities, the latest event in the series People, Prosperity and the Planet by the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative. I am Marcela Angel, Research Associate at the MIT ESI, an organization at MIT with the mandate to convene faculty, researchers and students on issues of the environment. Our People, Prosperity and the Planet series has hosted over the years diverse voices on global environmental challenges, such as climate change, plastics pollution, or deforestation of the Amazon, among other topics. And as we heard from our panelists in yesterday's session, there is an urgent need to address biodiversity laws, considering the multiple scales and capacities in which cities affect biodiversity, the interconnections between our species and the natural environment, the importance of advancing the social justice and environmental conservation agendas simultaneously, rethinking our development models and notions of prosperity and growth, and the broader social, political, and economic motivations of citizens to engage in environmental action. In today's session, we will be focused on a series of case studies and efforts from developing countries that showcase diverse biodiversity conservation pathways enabled by cities with a focus on the challenges and opportunities of the Global South. Again, I would like to thank our partners, the MIT's lone Latin American office and the Humboldt Institute in Colombia for designing and organizing this event with us. You can find more about ESI and our partners on these websites. I also want to thank our extraordinary speakers for being with us today and particularly thank Diana Ruiz, our moderator in today's session for co-organizing this event with us. Diana is research associate in the Territorial Management Program at the Humboldt Institute for Biological Resources Research in Colombia, and her work focuses on urban ecology and biodiversity conservation. Welcome, Diana. Thank you, Marcela, and hello, everyone. Uh, in today's session, we will have short presentation from the four speakers, and then we will have a moderate discussion. We also will be addressing questions for the audience, so please use the Q&A feature so to submit questions, and we will try to cover as many as possible. We have simultaneous translation English to Spanish. Eh, para el público en español, tendremos traducción simultánea, así que por favor activen Eh, esta opción en el, en, el, en, el, en el botón de globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la ventana. I will give brief introduction, but we will be posting our speakers' bios in the chat for everyone to find out more about them. Uh, we will begin the presentation with Norha Bayomi, PhD candidate in the Building Technology Program, research assistant at the Urban Metabolism Group at the MIT ESI, Norham presentation, uh, presentation will include urban metabolism analysis and reflection around case studies of cities in Egypt, Morocco, and Thailand. Welcome, Norham. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. So can everyone see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this panel and uh, many thanks to the ESI team for this kind invite. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, some of the work we're doing in the Urban Metabolism Group, uh, which focuses on examining uh, resource use intensity in urban areas and implications uh, on future sustainable growth and climate challenges. I will start with a brief introduction uh, on what is the concept and the root concept of the urban meta metabolism. Um, so as you can guess from the name, like cities can learn from uh, natural systems like human bodies and uh, the concept inspired by the name. So like the human bodies, uh, cities require resource to function. So they import or stock up what they, what they need from resources consume them and then dispose them uh, of what's left over in a form of different types of wastes. And if we can link that to city structure, uh, we have the components of 
population data uh, and the natural resources represented in water food that are required for the city to function. Uh, and you know, this, in addition to industrial materials and the outputs of wastes uh, coming from the consumption of these resources. So the idea of examining the urban system within the scope of, of the urban metabolism comes from different uh, layers over multiple layers to understand the impacts uh, of economic and industrial growth and what kind of resources needed, whether it's water resources, energy flows, and biomass, and how this would affect to the increase in the growth of the urban center, and what's the relationship between these different urban centers to uh, the national scale and the level of consumption. So this highlights how uh, the concept of urban metabolism can be a powerful metaphor for better understanding uh, our urban systems. And it also can be used as a fundamental framework uh, that we could use to accelerate that, that transition to a sustainable growth. So in that sense, uh, using the urban metabolism as a scope can help us uh, understand four major uh, components. The first one, by mapping the available resources and, and feeding into the current consumption trends, we can understand and model what, what are the types of challenges expected in the future. And using the outputs of that assessment, we can identify uh, types of opportunities for uh, efficiencies in resource uh, growth and outline what kind of scenarios and policies that are required to achieve or harness uh, the opportunities that we have identified. So I will, I will be talking today about uh, three main case study that we have been focusing on uh, in our group. Uh, so uh, I will start with two countries in the Middle East, uh, Egypt and uh, Morocco, North Africa, and uh, most recently the work we have started in Thailand. So in our work, we are looking at two different scales. The first one is the national scale, which is the country scale, and the second one, uh, one is the urban scale, which represent uh, the city center. And we are looking at five main uh, resource flows, uh, which is water, electricity, biomass, minerals, and fossil fuel. So I'll give you just a, a very quick uh, overview about the work we have done. So the graph you see here, it's a Sankey, it's called the Sankey diagram, which is a, a representation of uh, material and resource flows within the urban system. So here the system boundaries is the national boundaries of Egypt. And what you see here that most of the resource supply for water is coming from the Nile River. And uh, on the right side, you see what are the most contributing uh, sectors, economic sectors for consumption. As you can see that there is a huge chunk of uh, water is consumed in the agriculture uh, sector and how much is uh, wastewater and how much is treated water. And on the right, you see uh, a representation of these resources on a spatial level. So where is the Nile River is located with respect to the urban center. So we are using these two uh, techniques of uh, Sankey diagrams combined with uh, cartography methods to understand the spatial distribution of resources and what kind of uh, resource intensity are consumed in each uh, economic sector. Um, also, we did the same thing for electricity. So you can also see on the map uh, the concentration of the power generation uh, power plants, uh, which is represented in the plus orange uh, sign, and how this is distributed with respect to uh, the urban centers, uh, which is like the mega city of Cairo. And from the Sankey, we know how much is consumed within the household sector and the industrial sector. We did the same practice for uh, Morocco. Uh, so Morocco, uh, electricity, the structure of electricity is a bit different from Egypt, but we can see that there could be a, some similar trends uh, between the uh, consumption of electricity from industrial and household uh, versus what we have identified in Egypt, which could be an interesting way to start looking at what kind of uh, similarities that you can identify uh, with different countries in the same region. Uh, the same, we, we have done the same uh, exercise also for water resources and which is the thing you see here, the Sankey diagram you see on the screen. And uh, interestingly, uh, similar to Egypt, agriculture was the most uh, economic sector that contributed to uh, water consumption. Uh, finally, we just started this work in Thailand. Uh, so uh, this is a Sankey diagram for uh, electricity use. So interestingly, you can see that it's heavily dependent on uh, fossil fuel resources, specifically natural gas, which is kind of similar to what we have identified in, in, in the practice of uh, looking at electricity generation in Egypt. But the uh, structure of the consumption here is a bit different. Um, so there are some multiple 
uh, variations in uh, the, the, the consumption between industrial and residential and the domestic electricity supplied to uh, the economic center. Um, next, I'll just walk you through uh, how the same, same analysis has been done for uh, the urban centers. So we looked at two uh, main urban centers, uh, one in Morocco and one in, in Egypt, which is Cairo. And uh, we approached this uh, urban analysis in a very interesting way. So in Egypt, we picked a, a super urbanized city, which is Cairo, uh, just to understand the implications of expansion of, uh, of, uh, of, of the urban center on uh, increased demand on uh, resources, uh, which, is, which is in that case, you see here, the uh, increase in demand of fossil fuel for electricity generation, and how much that feed into the household sector, which is represented by the red areas uh, on the map on the right. Uh, in Morocco, we choose the growing city, which was a uh, Bengarir, which is a city that transitioning from being a ta small town to uh, a big city. Uh, so here the structure is different because the city is still growing and the infrastructure is still in the development phase. But uh, we can see that the majority of the demand is coming from uh, one specific power plant, which is this, because the city is still growing and that feeds into uh, heavy industry because the city is nearly located to one of the biggest uh, phosphate mines uh, in Morocco. So that's give you, give you a better understanding what kind of demand that you could expect versus what we have identified in Cairo uh, that it's mostly coming from the residential sector. Uh, we also have done a, a quick exercise on understanding uh, a city like Bingari that's uh, currently growing, uh, what kind of expected demand on the different uh, construction inputs when the city is expanding in the future. And what does that mean for uh, natural and industrial materials and minerals? Uh, and then we started to dissect that into different archetypes, building types, uh, to identify how much uh, material waste that you would expect from uh, the urban expansion. So uh, from this analysis, uh, the main idea is not just to map out, like I mentioned, the four main components, not just to map out the current resources, but also to identify and map challenges. And uh, we used uh, system dynamics modeling here to understand the interconnection between uh, the main resources with respect to future population growth. So the model you see on the left is a system dynamics model that's capturing the relationship between the different uh, implications on population growth for water demand, uh, agriculture, and what does that mean for water losses, uh, network supply, for power supply. And the, the graph you see here is basically driven by uh, the population growth in this specific region. And then we use that to go to step four, which is ties to the four main components, which here we examining policy scenarios and policy scenarios. So understanding what kind of policy that we could trigger to improve resource use and opportunities for uh, resource efficiency. And this is how this whole framework of mapping current resources, identifying the challenges, and then linking that to different potential scenarios to use that to guide policymaker on what kind of opportunities and pathways for efficiency in the future. Um, I'll just end by a small um, uh, overview about how we're taking this work forward. So uh, the graph you see here is part of the work that has been done by Professor Fernandez, um, which is a typologies of cities. So combining cities uh, that are having similar trends of resource use to understand how, how different urbanization phases can affect uh, demands for different resources. So uh, we are trying to link that work right now to incorporating machine learning models and techniques to uh, examine resource efficiency without diving deeper into the details of mapping um, this kind of high level uh, analysis of material flow. So by looking at using uh, satellite imagery and computer vision techniques, we can start to see what is the changing over time in the urban center. And that could imply that this city is still growing. There are changes happening. There is an expansion of the urban area. And then we could use that as a metric to identify what does that mean for uh, resource use and resource potential. And, um, also linking that to potential climate risks, uh, like increasing in precipitation level and increasing temperature. What does that mean for natural resources availability versus uh, expected population growth? 
So that summarized the, the presentation. Um, so uh, basically, this is where we are right now with the group, and we're very excited about taking this uh, work forward. And thank you. Thank you, Norhan, for highlighting the complexity of relationship and flows between cities and other systems at different scales. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce our second speaker of the evening, Nicolás Galarza. Uh, he is Vice Minister of Environmental Sustainable Development of Colombia, and he will talk about the vision for Colombia's biodiversity initiative and the goals of the main cities participating in this program. Nicolás couldn't join us today, but we sh he shared with us a video of his presentation. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and inviting uh, the Ministry of uh, the Environment and Urban Development of Colombia to share some of the lessons that we've uh, developed so far and acquired so far through the implementation of this idea of uh, President Duque uh, aiming to integrate, to better integrate cities and uh, nature and particularly cities to biodiversity. Taking part of this event, I want to especially thank the Environmental Solutions Initiative, uh, its director John Fernandez and Marcela, with whom uh, we've been having very interesting and fruitful discussions. Uh, we're very grateful uh, to, to be given this opportunity to share a little bit of what we've done and what we're trying to pursue here at the Colombian government with this idea of biodiversity, uh, which aims to not only integrate better nature to cities, but also to have biodiversity at the core of urban uh, development. This is a, a new initiative, but we are championing throughout the world and we're very happy to have such a distinguished uh, space here at MIT to share a bit what we have been doing. So I have prepared a brief slide deck uh, to show you a bit what we've done and the narrative and the logic behind uh, what we're doing. And I'm gonna just jump right, right to it. So firstly, I, you know, I, I, this is uh, an uh, uh, initiated, let's say, or a, a worldly uh, uh, auditorium and public on, the, on urban matters. So I'm just not gonna uh, go about the relevance in cities, particularly in terms of, of population GDP generated, but also that that produces a very high share of uh, carbon emissions. So that's, uh, let's say, a given I don't need to elaborate. Uh, we have seen, though, that even though cities, as we saw, produce the bulk of the greenhouse gas emissions, they have also a big potential in order to produce uh, innovative uh, solutions. And we see how uh, uh, air pollution, mainly generated by fossil fuel combustion, combustion uh, produces roughly 20% of the deaths uh, related by uh, chronic respiratory diseases. And that in itself gives an obvious solution in terms of having better green cover and having, uh, reducing air pollution to produce uh, healthier spaces for citizens. Um, we have also seen uh, proven effects of the temperature uh, increases that we have seen since industrial levels. And we have seen how green cover and trees in cities can reduce up to 13% of the uh, temperature of the planet. And in that particular regard, we've seen how climate change has uh, been affected or and will affect the GDP uh, worldwide uh, up to five percentage points. And uh, there are numerous initiatives on ad adaptation mainly that show how through them we can save significant amounts of money in terms of, uh, of uh, the impact or the negative impact of climate change in GDP, the impact uh, we've seen how that works in Thailand, uh, where they have calculated that roughly uh, 10,000 US dollars are saved 
per hectare that is protected of a mangroves. And there is also a huge opportunity going along those lines in terms of uh, having a more resilient, green and sustainable approach to our infrastructure in terms of updation and in terms of developing new initiatives. It has been calculated that we could easily generate up to, up to uh, 24 million new jobs by 2030. So we can see clearly how there are different uh, uh, solutions and how there is a very big opportunity in terms of including biodiversity to see the development uh, to its core. And uh, uh, there are also some examples here that uh, we want to show in terms of the implementation of nature-based solutions, new uh, metrics that allow us to accurately assess the impact in terms of economics that uh, we have in terms of degradation of our biodiversity. In this uh, regard, we've seen the Dasgupta review recently issued that has shown how we've failed to incorporate the economical costs of uh, Degradate the, the, the yeah, degradation in terms of uh, ecosystems and biodiversity in, in into the uh, GDP equation, and failing to do that has led us to a very large extent to the climate crisis that we today uh, live, and uh, we can have easily fiscal savings from uh, uh, what we. Uh, are developing with some of the examples that you see here uh, through enhanced previous covers we and the implementation generally speaking of urban drainage systems we can have an increased and uh, more efficient uh, hydrology cycle at the metropolitan scale we've seen how through uh, bold initiatives in uh, city in latin american cities like mexico and santiago it is estimated that they save up to $10 million uh, uh, in public health systems due, due to the reduced uh, chronic diseases produced. And uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned before, we have uh, the opportunity of uh, creating numerous jobs in the transition to a carbon neutral economy in Colombia we are we have committed to reducing uh, 51 of our greenhouse emissions by 2030 so as you can see what we are identifying is not the value per se of in terms of nature and ecosystem services but there is clearly a fiscal component that complements very well the narrative behind including and enhancing uh, and an integration between cities and biodiversity, and that's what we're trying to work out. This, however, is uh, fairly recent, and for that reason, this we like to think of it as work work in progress. So we've made some developments. I'll talk more about the international work that we're that we're doing, but uh, we have developed a general framework which I'm gonna share share with you in terms of what we think and understand of uh, biodiversity. And as you can read it, it is a city that recognizes, prioritizes and integrates biodiversity and its benefits towards a sustainable urban regional development. And what, what does, we, we have uh, tried to follow a, a three-pronged approach in terms of thinking about sustainable economies, enhancing bioeconomy in cities and capitalizing the bioeconomy of ecosystems on the surroundings of cities. Of course, having a very strong approach in terms of circular economy and reducing waste. A second, uh, the second prong is uh, to merge biodiversity and its benefits into territorial planning, which is kind of the core of the idea. And for that reason, as we've already spoken about, we are including urban trees, sustainable urban drainage systems, 
eco-urbanism, eco-urban tourism, and so forth. And of course, there is a third layer that includes the individual behavior and the individual practices that uh, allow us to, uh, to, to kind of have a more holistic approach, not only spending on government initiatives or the private sector, but also at the individual level. In that sense, we uh, have uh, developed different initiatives uh, that uh, range from uh, nurseries, uh, tree nurseries to, to monitor initiatives and science-based or citizen-based uh, science that uh, likely will be discussed later on by some of the other panelists uh, that are also coming uh, from Colombia. So having a conceptual framework in place allow us to have kind of a differentiated strategy uh, to engage cities because this is a national initiative and we could not do that uh, to implement this at the local level without having the cities shipping in. And for that reason, there are like three levels of development in which uh, we are following the engagement of cities, the obvious launching the strategy and the launching more than a launch itself is an assessment and a diagnostic of the types of projects that our cities are thinking about and are developing to incorporate biodiversity uh, in or, or, or to better include biodiversity within their cities. Then you find, and we're providing technical assistance to the structuring of these projects and to uh, help them become reality. It is very often, uh, in my experience, to find a lot of ideas on the ground at the city level, but very, very little conceptual development. And in that sense, it is very hard to try to provide financial assistance if you have an idea of a project but had absolutely no clue how much uh, the, project, the project costs. And later, after having uh, the technical assistance and having the projects fully structured and having passed uh, the feasibility uh, phase, then we can think about co-financing and monitoring the, impl the, the implementation of these projects. So roughly speaking, this is the path that we followed with the cities and uh, it has led us to uh, the progress that I'm uh, about to show you. Local governments, of course, need to commit. We sign an agreement with the local governments. We request that at least one project is in profitability or feasibility, and one of the projects is also ready for implementation. And we ask in different regards as a cross-cutting approach, let's say uh, a more kind of uh, holistic initiative to include environmental education at its core. So what have we seen so far on, on, on what have we learned? The nature of the projects is really, really, it varies uh, widely. And uh, we are, we're thinking about uh, projects that recover uh, river basins or uh, salt marshes. And we're also uh, have uh, territories and municipalities that wanna build uh, botanic gardens uh, amongst um, many other. And the nature of the projects, as you can see, is very, very different. And we need to have a differentiated strategy in, in terms of uh, how we provide. And that also uh, means uh, dealing with different capacities of technical governments. And uh, in all cases, uh, and I'm sure this is now gonna, not, not going to be uh, news to anyone, uh, money is always an issue. And uh, there is so much resources that you can have. So uh, there is always the issue of how to uh, have the projects once they're structured to be implemented. But I think we've managed fairly well to allocate resources to at least uh, boost the uh, final uh, or, or the first cohort of cities uh, uh, worldwide. Now, we have been working with 10 cities in Colombia 
following this uh, path that I have uh, shown to you, uh, trying to develop infrastructure and projects that allows them to protect their main environmental assets. We've been working with the cities that you see on the map, Barranquilla, Monteria, Medellin, Bucaramanga, Barranca Mermeja, Manizales, Villavicencio, Leticia, Quibdó, San Andres, and we have other ones coming down the pipeline. We have identified 14 projects so far. We have uh, secured uh, $69 million out of the 85 that we have identified so far, and we're aiming to at least have five projects ready by the end of next year. I close with uh, an idea that uh, we have been championing with the Humboldt Institute and with the World Economic Forum, trying to scale this initiative up. Because as I mentioned, this is work in progress. I think the, the Skupta review was uh, groundbreaking and enlightening in many regards. And uh, this is not something that uh, can be done at the national level because we're also aiming to increase awareness of the importance and the relevance of biodiversity in cities. And for that reason, on top of the work that we're doing on the ground with cities, we have made this partnership called Biodiversities by 2030, again, with the Humboldt Institute, which is a research institute here in Colombia, and the World Economic Forum to create a model that is more global and more international and that can be easily uh, addressed and uh, implemented in different cities with different realities and different capacities. And that can not only be done within a Colombian context. And for that reason, uh, in this partnership, we have launched a high level commission of more than 30, 30 uh, world renowned experts that uh, come from all walks of life uh, from uh, the, the academy, from public sector, the private sector, with a very, very uh, representative sample, people from North America, Europe, Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And we are hoping to put together a white paper that will probably will create, that will probably create a more uh, international uh, approach and let's say a more universal approach to the inclusion of biodiversity in cities. We are giving our first uh, steps through the projects that we're doing, but also creating a global alliance. So this is early work, this is work in progress, and we are not doing this by ourselves. So we are very encouraged to find an audience here uh, at, the, at MIT, at the Environmental Solutions Initiative, and we're hoping to develop more work together. We're hoping to have a lot of people thinking about this and investing resources and to scale this up to make this a global movement. So I thank you very much for this space and I wish you a rest of a very successful uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Okay, we will now move on to our third speaker, Ana Maria Bermudez. She is a researcher at the Interdisciplinary Center for Developmental Studies, CIDER at Los Andes University in Colombia. And Ana Maria will share some reflections around the need to leverage biodiversity as a competitiveness pillar for cities in biodiversity hotspots. Welcome, Ana Maria. Hello, everyone. I'm going to speak a little bit about our empirical research that we have done um, about what happened um, when you have talent retention and we use that biodiversity in the Pacific Coast as a mean to an end. So I'm going to first give you a little bit of context of the Pacific Coast and um, some of the issues that we have seen in human um, capital development. And then I'm gonna show you our first approach 
as um, empirical research of the biodiversity being used as talent retention um, and then what, what we have been seeing in the communities. And then some recommendations and some uh, feedback of what we have been doing. In that sense, um, the Pacific Coast is located, um, it goes all the way from the top, um, it goes, it, it, go, it border all the ocean, the Pacific Ocean in Colombia, and is mainly be, it has mainly four states, Chocó, Valle del Cauca, Cauca, and Nariño. It's mainly, um, his population is mainly black population and we have about 170 municipalities. The population is about the 16% of the country's population. The GDP is the 13th of the, of the country's GDP. And we are known because we are the um, biodiversity hotspot, the second biodiversity hotspot. We have about 73% of the country's mangroves 18% of the protective zones and 16 of the forest reserves. With that being said, we are really um, have, we are not, um, we are, have more rural areas than urban, but our population is more concentrated in the big cities. For the past years, we have tried to see um, how the biodiversity has been one mean to actually potent, um, to have the Pacific a retention talent. Why? Because we know that most of our individuals leave the, this, the region to do a studies or to, they migrate to a different places and they don't tend to come back. But we are seeing now that they have four pillars to understand this issue. The first one is um, what happened with the students. So because we are a really um, retired um, region of Colombia and we have a lot of issues between um, low income and a lot of uh, different situations. We have seen uh, students leave the, the cities and therefore um, a they don't have a, a lot of motivation to come back. In that sense, uh, we know the government have done a lot of investing in the students in order to help them gain knowledge and tell them so like learn how to use the actives that the um, that we have as a hotspot to make changes and create the line to um, development that we actually need in it in order to close the gaps that we have and to have more opportunities as a city our cities may have more opportunities and they can grow better. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about some um, tal a human capabilities projects that are actually going on right now in one of the states and how one of the externalities that we have actually seen about those projects are the constructions of new startups that are based on the use of biodiversity. Um, my main resource area is how we can have more um, talent retention in the Pacific Coast. And we have seen, as I told you before, that we have uh, some investments from the government to build capa um, some capabilities from, from individuals. And most of them have been done with um, money from the state, as I said before. So we have um, a program that is financed by um, the Ministry of Science and Technology, and it helps as, um, high school students to develop uh, the scientific vocation. Then we have another one that is financed for the local government. And they actually try to uh, take some of the really well-known and well-formed um, master students and professionals back to um, the state of Chaco and help the students gain more knowledge in on those different areas mainly the same areas, but also how to use the things that they have in their environment in order to make some changes. So how do can use um, natural habitats as a lab to learn um, different ways to, so sort of like get that um, knowledge a little bit more well-rounded. And finally, we have um, a really big investment into create 
into closing the gap of um, having masters and PhD professionals in the Pacific Coast. And that last one, I believe is the one that has most powerful um, impact the region. Why? Because we have, we, that, um, the theory tell, tell us that people tend to move um, around the different cities in different countries depends on where they feel that they can have better opportunities to develop um, themselves. But in this case, we actually have seen that these students are coming back to the region um, even though they know they can actually be, have more potential every, every, somewhere else. And um, I want to bring some um, examples that we have seen on some of those, of those externalities of talent retention. And why I think this is important? Because I think the cities in the Pacific Coast are mainly constructed on Asian um, costumes. And with those students bringing that new knowledge, we have seen uh, the creation of new startups and then a new shape for the ecosystem. And what I mean by that is that um, we have seen that those students that have actually now gained PhD programs, um, um, PhD um, education, they are coming back and creating enterprises that are changing and are transforming the main things that they used to do before, such as like food, um, agricultural food, and they're using some local fruits and local um, knowledge to transform and make some products. Um, what, as the vice minister called it, we use a lot of bioeconomy. And then they are actually trying to use their knowledge and to transform and conserve and preserve the environment and um, to like make jobs in the, in the state, which is something that we were actually fighting before. Because as I told you, most of them actually left and then they weren't actually thinking of coming back. So that's why um, I started this conversation by saying that the biodiversity for us is seen as a mean to an end. As a mean, not just to have talent retention, but to also shape the new way that we need to actually think of um, the development of the whole Pacific coast and the Shokoa state, which is the sample that I'm bringing to you right now. Um, I don't want to really give a lot of um, information about those companies. You can actually Google it if you want to. But my main focus with, that, with this example is that um, not a lot of research has been done in the talent retention uh, and how to use this to shape the new cities that we need. And the Pacific Coast has a lot of, how do I put this? It has a lot of potential but also needs a lot of guidance. And since, every, since always we have heard different people telling us what to do, this, um, this situation is really disruptive because the same people that are born and raised in the, in the communities are now building um, and shaping the new ways to implement uh, the biodiversity as a mean to create, to create development and to have new uh, enterprises. And all of this actually is taking us to think in um, different in small in different situations. The first one is that um, we definitely live inside um, the house, but, but also we need to be able to know how to use it for our advantage and to, not just to nurture the, the use of the environment, but also to preserve it. And as I told you, all this human capital that we are gaining right now is the main driver to create that new uh, environment. The second one is that um, our nature, nature vocation is to be um, the, preserver, the preservers of the, of the environment, right? And then that's what our ancestors have been doing for the past decades. But now um, adding the element of knowledge and technical knowledge, we can actually reshape and rehab and so like redirect the way that we see the development for our territories. And then that's something that is really uh, powerful in order to think of how this, the, Cho the Choco and the Pacific Coast will be playing a role. Um, we have had to play a role so like model for the next um, generations. 
And also, um, we know that with all those new changes, we need to create our own model of development. Why? Because we are really particular, not just because of the biodiversity, because of the different diversity that we have in culture and also our population being um, with, the low, with the lowest GDP and all those conditions that makes our, our community really vulnerable. We actually need to create um, so like a, a path that will actually guide us from within us in order to be able to um, have sustainability and to have development as we, we all want it. And to me, the main key is that we have to use this high qualified talent that we are having and that we're actually trying to come back as, as the way to figure out how to create that new path and how to make that a strategy that will actually benefit not just the Pacific Coast, but probably the, the whole country. And we can actually be able to be an example for the world um, in terms of development and sustainability. And I can think that's the message that I wanted to um, give everyone. Thank you very much, Ana Maria, for this inspiring presentation about the importance of local initiative and economies to include biodiversity in, in regional development. Uh, finally, we will have the presentation of Aliyu Barao. Aliyu is Associate Profession of Urban and Regional Planning at Bayero University in Nigeria. He will present case studies from West African cities and some reflections about the interconnected social and ecological processes. Welcome, Aliyu. Good morning, maybe somewhere, somewhere good afternoon. And of course here it is um, uh, good evening. I think it is uh, my great honor and uh, uh, pleasure uh, to be given uh, an opportunity uh, to speak uh, this very uh, important um, meeting. Um, one, I'm not going to really have a kind of, um, uh, if you like, standard presentation. This one is going to be a kind of discursive presentation that would move around and at the uh, end of the day, try to answer uh, questions that you, um, the uncle has just raised. And thank you once again for that. Now there is an adage um, uh, in house language, which says, if you want to know what is happening to the heart, ask the face. So now I want to just to have a look at this picture. And from what you can see, this is in a poor neighborhood of Kano in Northern Nigeria. These are a group of some millennials from Bayero University, Kano, uh, who are engaging with local communities to restore some of the indigenous tree species that were lost. And you can see small children and some members of the community who joined them to deliver this uh, indigenous tree restoration project in their neighborhood. It is interesting to note that the ancient city of Kano dates back to more than 1000 years. And most of the neighborhoods in the city uh, are named after some indigenous trees. And this shows you or tells you the uh, interconnectivity between people and nature and trees in, in particular. And now if you look at this uh, picture of the old city of Kano, and this picture I think um, shows or depicts the city in early 1970s. And from what you can see, uh, Kano is a typical dry land city. It is located approximately some 800 kilometers away from the edge of the Sahara Desert. But over time, 
uh, the city has developed strong institutions of uh, biodiversity and urban resilience. You may notice that you can see that within uh, neighborhoods, if you can see this arrow, you can see some trees, meaning that most of the households would keep at least one tree within uh, their houses. And given the fact that uh, this is uh, an in indigenous tree, it's not like in the wet tropics where a lot of trees grow. So, but um, um, this picture again tells a lot of story and I tried to enumerate them. And uh, I started with number one saying that, yeah, indigenous tree in every house. But if you look at the architecture, the mud architecture is made from grass and mud. And that this makes rainwater to be absorbed by buildings. And because it is not repellent, not much excess water is being driven out. So this one prevented, you know, um, flooding. And you can see it's not tarred. It's just an open ground, open soil, where a lot of water can seek, I mean, can soak underground, penetrate and keep some water which underground, which would be um, important for um, the city as a, for maybe a source of water for underground water, especially for, for wells. And again, this color, which is brownish, is low in albedo. So the city is not um, uh, overly hot, even during the uh, uh, extreme uh, heat season or dry season. And the trees help the, uh, in cooling. Uh, of course, because they are indigenous trees, they are also a uh, source of food. They provide some leaves that have been used for cooking and some fruits that have been used. And of course, it also these trees also serve as habitats uh, for uh, insects, even some reptiles. Uh, you know, some bears and what have you. And, and culturally speaking, again, people make use of um, these trees for landmarking purposes, where they can, where they can say, for instance, uh, this neighborhood is located close to this or that uh, tree species. And of course, they have uh, spiritual values. So some of the locals here, uh, actually have phobia for some trees. And that phobia, that fear of some trees, which they believe are homes of some spirits, give security for some of these trees to survive for many years. And this is what has happened for many, many centuries. I think President Jimmy Carter visited Kano in, in 1981. The Queen of England, um, Ellie the Base, visited Kano in 1956. So many, many other world leaders have visited uh, this ancient uh, African city. So now, if you look at this, this is a contrast of what we have just shown. This is another part of the city that has embraced modernization, does away with culture, embraces exotic and ornamental trees instead of the indigenous one and but but this is a side of site where you can identify with the rich with the corporate community so absolutely this represents a zenith of deculturalization of biodiversity and urban resilience institutions that had existed for many years now this on the other hand this represents what you got, what do we get um, in the Fuara part of the city, the old city. And what you see still, there is this culture of uh, some households keeping some trees. But compared to the first picture that uh, I have shown, you can see the trees now are fewer than what you can, uh, you 
you could see there. And you can see the roofing uh, as well has changed. There are now iron uh, corrugated sheets instead of the flat mud roofs that we had there. And definitely these uh, signals increase in uh, erosion, instance of, uh, of flooding as well. Uh, in, in this Amflan uh, area, or part of the city, which now has fewer uh, home uh, trees. So now what we do, I said it that um, many neighborhoods in urban Kano are historically named after um, some indigenous trees. Now, what you can see here in this picture is from a project that we undertook through our uh, lab, which we call Mr. City Lab. Mr. City Lab uh, stands for Millennials and Resilience, Cities Innovation and Transformation of Jews. Most of these guys are millennials. They are our students from, from the university. So we coach them, we train them on the process of knowledge co-production and co-creation. We, we encourage them to work with communities because what is happening actually is that uh, many communities uh, that got their name from indigenous trees have lost such trees. So you ask children there, you ask young people there, do you know this tree? Or do you know, are you aware that your community is named after a tree? He will say, yes, I know. Have you ever seen that tree? I have never seen it. So some of the trees actually have disappeared. So we had to make, see, make serious effort to get some of the trees, but there are two species actually that up to now, we could not get them to restore them into uh, those communities. But, we are still making. So this part is of that project. And we allow these young people to take the leadership on their hands, to lead, work with communities, to co-design the project and even do it. I, I remember of a case where some communities waited from morning until 10 p.m. in the nightfall waiting for this uh, team to come and raise two, three, uh, for them. So this is a quite interesting initiative that we put in place in order to restore uh, indigenous trees. And by restoring indigenous trees, we are one, trying to re-establish re um, community uh, nature relations. Um, as I said, most of these indigenous trees, it happens that in these drier parts, of, of Nigeria that are threatened by desertification. Authorities are more often than not do emphasize use of um, exotic tree species for combating desertification. But these indigenous exotic species are foreign. They don't know this terrain very well, much as the indigenous species know. Many birds, many insects actually depend on these uh, tree species. But now as we are trying to restore them and you can see the, the, the community members are happy, members of our lab are happy. So this is in other words, another way of, um, as I said, reconnecting people with nature and with trees in particular as um, elements that can uh, support uh, urban biodiversity. So now this is a map of, um, of uh, urban Kano. And most of the names that you can see here are local names of trees. Like this one is uh, Pakia uh, Big Labosa, as example, the one that I have just shown you. So these are the community, these are the names, scientific name of the trees that we have tried to restore into various um, neighborhoods. So in total, we were able to restore uh, 17 uh, indigenous tree species. And these have many 
uh, values and services uh, for the community, um, for food and nutritional values. Some of them have immense medicinal values and they equally help in um, like attenuating uh, uh, urban heat island. Uh, uh, and of course, um, we do believe that by restoring um, these trees, we are equally creating new grounds, grounds for some bird species to, to come to the city. It is very interesting to note that um, we, we conducted a study in 2013, which uh, was published in the journal Urban uh, Ecosystems. We worked like on um, the palace gardens and some of these palace gardens, uh, the two of them in particular that we have studied are over 500 years. And today they are the only habitats for thousands and thousands of bats that you see them in a very amazing and picturesque, um, uh, if you like, um, 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 picture of, of, of the city because in, in, in the evening you see how these bats, uh, you know, cover many parts of the city, but you can see they only depend on the palace royal gardens. Meaning that without uh, the royal gardens, Kano City would have lost um, um, many, many vital uh, birds uh, or faunal uh, species. So this is, in other words, um, an African message, an African perspective, an African city's uh, perspective, if you like, uh, for what nature-based solutions uh, stand for. And uh, as well as um, a strategy for addressing some of the challenges that um, um, rapid urbanization uh, brings about in Africa. So I say many thanks from our team and equally from our USAN team, um, yeah, which I'm heading as the director for the West Africa Hub. I'm very sure some of you are aware of our work with um, Cynthia Rothenberg at Columbia University in the New York City. Uh, where I'm um, serving as the director of West Africa for the Urban Climate Change Research Network. So I thank you very much indeed for, for the chance uh, to speak to you and uh, I look forward to receiving your questions and comments. So thank you very much indeed. And bye. Thank you, Ali, and thank you for pointing out that cities as social ecological system in which people relate and connect with nature in many different ways. And now thank you all for your thoughtful opening presentation. It is great to be able to hear about the specific ways and ongoing efforts to connect biodiversity conservation with equity building and sustainable development in the Global South. Now to open the Q&A session, I would like to start with a question. This is for Norhan. Uh, Norhan, there is growing evidence that urbanization processes affect areas far beyond the borders of cities. How can urban metabolism analysis help cities minimize land conversion and resource consumption with, within and beyond the city boundaries? So with the work we're doing in the urban metabolism, we're also examining um, like what's happening outside the urban boundary, which in that case, the, the, the case you mentioned, how urbanization can affect surrounding uh, natural resources. Um, so how we're doing this with the urban metabolism work is basically examining uh, what kind of pressure that could come from expanding the urban centers. So the case, for example, in Cairo, uh, we have identified that the growth in, in the, the greater Cairo boundary has uh, uh, minimized uh, the agriculture, the surrounding agriculture land that's surra that surround the, the urban boundaries of Cairo. And um, using that information, we, 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 can, we can understand 
what kind of measures that need to be introduced, like limiting the urban sprawl, for example, um, how we can improve, uh, like the, what kind of policies that need to put in place to protect uh, the natural resources. So the urban metabolism is, is not only focusing on the scale of the urban center or the urban boundary only, but it, it can also sometimes link to how this would affect uh, surrounding natural resources, because most of the analysis we have done that in most cases, the, the natural resources location is, is a bit far from the, the boundaries of the urban center. And this is what we're trying to capture um, with the mix between uh, cartography techniques, like the spatial mapping of resources and the location of the urban concentration. So we can get a sense how the exp expansion can affect uh, natural resources. Thank you, Norham. And now I would like to continue with Ana Maria. Ana Maria, uh, what do you think are the main challenge for cities in the Pacific region to incorporate biodiversity manage management into their development strategies? Yeah, well, some of the things that um, are actually directed to what I say before, but one of the things that I think is the main trigger um, to include the biodiversity as, um, as you know, in the path to development is the knowledge. You know, most of the time we create development plans um, outside the sea, outside the region, and then um, without knowing really what happened in the region, it's really hard to make uh, plans that are really um, adequate to to the people in the communities. So um, what I'm that's why my my talk was about using talent and retention to create those plans. So if we use the people that know the regions and are cap capable and have um, knowledge in different areas, we can better include the biodiversity as a mean to development and not just for conservation and preservation of the species. Um, some, some of the information that I didn't give you was that mostly 50% of the species that we have in the Pacific I haven't been studied yet. So um, it's really hard if you try to create plans from outside the region to include the things that are unknown because you don't know those type of situations. So uh, for me, one of the challenges is to incorporate, um, so like the center as the country and the local knowledge in order to have a better path for um, including the ecosystem and the way that the ecosystem works with the people in the communities. Thank you, Ana Maria. And finally, to our our next question is for Aliyu. Uh, what are some of the ways in which urban biodiversity supports urban and community resilience? Will, will you kindly repeat the question, please? What are some of the ways in which urban biodiversity supports urban and community resilience? Yeah, uh, thank you. That's a good question. I think uh, that comes in many ways, Diana. Um, I think from my, my presentation, it is clear that I have tried to take us to history and linking again with what Maria has mentioned of what you do and what would benefit community directly, not what you do from outside. So if, if you mention, to, for instance, uh, the whole idea of, of resilience, I think uh, urban resilience is the ability of a city to persist, right? And sustain its ability for food, for instance, to, again, um, uh, its own maybe sources of food, like I said, nutrition, um, and as well, climate security. Um, we have seen that from some of the images that I have shown. In a situation whereby a given environment become concretized with too little water going underground to recharge the underground. In the case of dryland city like Kano, or anywhere, whether it is in Egypt or anywhere. Like you see, water security is fundamental to, to, to urban resilience. So we got a system 
um, where local trees uh, provide, for instance, sources of food and medicine for community. And then uh, as well give uh, like children and young people abilities to, to experience their, their natural landscape, understand uh, many facets of, of nature. They live around nature and, and, and with nature. And sometimes what they do is even dictated by, by nature. And I think that one will, will in many ways strengthen their ability to live in, in their own environment, experience it, use it, and depend on it. And when a particular community is able to utilize its own local environmental resources, then it will be able to, you know, reduce its dependency on um, resources from distant places. When local resources are exhausted, then as we know, naturally with cities, they exert a lot of pressure on environment of distant uh, uh, places, sometimes even at, um, at global scales, like what we call uh, teleconnections, right, of, of, of cities uh, and towns. So what, what we are saying essentially is yes, when we use biodiversity at local place, we are by implication and by extension adding fragile on resources in distant places. And those distant places may include some forests in distant places, maybe around you know, towns and cities, and sometimes the hinterland like for energy, use of fuel, fuel, fuel wood in, in Africa, for instance, which uh, many uh, communities still depend on for cooking. So as cities grow, and when they are not able to keep some of this, I understand that as, as population grows. But one interesting example about Kano um, was that I believe since um, um, 15th century, it had been able to maintain its size in a fashion of what um, Ebenezer Howard, uh, you know, designed in the sense that more than two third of Kano city were not developed. And yet it, it was a kind of uh, a big African cities, one of the first cities that emerged in, in, uh, in the first map, maps of, of, of Africa drawn by, by, many, by many explorers. So this tells you that um, communities uh, if we reflect on what happened in the past, without disruptions, sometimes disruptions come from outside. Colonialism, for instance, is a total disruption to how uh, Africans organize their faces. How look at Kano, for instance, located on the edge of Sahara, but the temperatures were moderate because all around the city there were city pumps where a lot of water is collected and it recharges underground water. And sometimes traditionally people can use containers just to draw water from, from wells, right? Because of excess recharge of, of water. And, and people use large expanse of land, you know, to farm their basic, uh, needs of, of food. So now with the coming of, um, of colonialists, a lo lot of changes uh, happened. Maybe sometime the role of urban planning, we want you to, to grow this way, right? So fundamentally, yes, cities will lose their characteristics and the abilities of resilience through disruption. And as I said, um, the ability of any city to continue to use its resources in a friendly way, ability to um, uh, keep their growth within limits 
is what defines urban resilience. I hope I answer your question. Thank you, Aliyu. Uh, we will now close with a video of the Vice Minister, Minister answering the following question. Uh, promoting biodiversity conservation in cities has many different co-benefits for citizens and the environment. Can you talk more about how the biodiversity program balances those co-benefits and what are some of the metrics of, of success of the program? How do they fit together with other plans such as development plans, land use or climate, climate change plans? I would like to highlight three main key points uh, regarding the analysis that Colombia has undergone in terms of uh, co-benefits. The first one has to do with uh, the positive impacts of increasing and improving the green cover on cities. Uh, first, I would like to highlight uh, something that could seem uh, uh, rather evident, but the literature is pretty clear in terms of the positive effect that uh, tree cover and green cover has reducing temperatures and more broadly speaking, the heat island effect. Uh, some studies that we have uh, seen have shown how both uh, there can be a significant uh, reduction on uh, temperatures that could go up to 13% in places and urban areas that have a more rich uh, presence of urban trees and green cover. And in addition to that, you can also see a significant increase in terms of the usage of uh, public space, uh, given that they're more friendly, that there's shade, and uh, in overall, it, they are more uh, comfortable. Now, in that particular regard, we have also identified uh, something key in terms of the reduction of respiratory chronic diseases due to the presence, again, of an enhanced uh, land cover, uh, a green cover, sorry. So when we have more uh, trees, uh, air is cleaner and therefore chronic diseases tend to reduce. And there's also an additional uh, metric that we have measured, conducted uh, partly by the Humboldt Institute here in Colombia, our partner, our partner in the Biodiversities, uh, Biodiversities Initiative that has shown how an increased green cover uh, has a positive impact in terms of connectivity and presence of wild, wildlife and generally speaking, a more healthy uh, landscape in terms of ecosystems. A second point that I'd like to uh, highlight has to do with uh, the need to implement uh, nature-based solutions, even though an enhanced uh, green cover it is already a nature-based solution. And I would like to do so by uh, talking a bit about what has happened recently in uh, uh, the island of Colombia in the Caribbean that suffered the devastation caused by the Yota hurricane. And one of our research institutes that uh, deals with uh, uh, sea and coastal uh, matters identified that the areas on the islands that were affected by the hurricane that were least affected uh, were those where there was a rich presence of healthy mangrove ecosystem. So uh, this is uh, really important also to highlight. And we indeed saw two different examples, the park, the water park of Iztapalapa in Mexico City is a park in which through the usage of uh, sustainable uh, drainage systems uh, or sustainable urban systems, you can have a more holistic and adequate uh, management of storm waters. And uh, in this sense, in the larger scale, you can identify better health of the hydrology cycle of water. And when you have that, 
uh, and you manage to attack, let's say, the uh, presence of impervious areas that are very common within cities and you allow the soil to drain naturally and to recharge uh, with these uh, su sustainable urban systems, you are impacting the overall uh, cycle at the metropolitan level. And that's the third co-benefit that uh, I would like to highlight, which is uh, the need to understand cities at a more metropolitan scale. And in that regard, you can see how factoring this scale, particularly pertaining to protect uh, large areas of uh, environmental assets that city have that are not necessarily within the, the, the city uh, limits, but that are crucial in the provision of ecosystem services that is something that you need to, to uh, undergo and to make happen in terms of the implementation of these services. So overall, these three ideas not only have benefits in terms of the ecosystem, uh, don't only uh, have uh, benefits in terms of human health, but they do also have important impacts uh, from the fiscal standpoint reducing chronic diseases, uh, reducing the need for investing and maintaining large drainage infrastructures, and of course, also through adaptation initiatives that mitigate uh, risks uh, as uh, uh, floods and landslides. So as you can see, there is a very strong and cohesive narrative in terms of the co-benefits, and we are aiming to include all of these types of projects through the work that we are doing and we are hoping to scale it uh, to make it uh, more legally binding as these projects uh, are developed and implemented on land use plans and uh, metropolitan plans and master plans in uh, in colombia so we are really driving to making our plans on our land use uh, uh, tools more sensitive and more inclusive of uh, climate, change, uh, climate change and uh, a nature positive approach uh, in regards to what uh, has to do with urban development and cities in Colombia. Um, okay, we are getting close to the end. I am delighted to have had the opportunity to be in this discussion with all of you. Thank you so much to the audience for being here, to our panelists for your contribution, and to the MIT ESI for convening us for this event today. Now I'll pass it to John Fernandez. John is director of the MIT ESI. Hi, John. Thank you so much, Tiana. Uh, thank you to all panelists today and yesterday. It's been an extremely rich exposition of the many topics related to cities and biodiversity. This is really an area of study and actions that's just just emerging. Um, and it's emerging to offer rigorous theoretical frameworks as well as humane and equitable solution pathways for cities around the world. Emerging at the same time, just as quickly, is the dire need to know how to mitigate the effects of rapid urbanization on ecosystems and terrestrial and marine species. So with that, thank you so much to Diana Ruiz of the Humboldt Institute in moderating the session today and also working with the ESI to organize this event. Thank you to Aaron Kroll of the ESI for providing communication support for this event. And finally, great thanks to Marcela Angel, a research associate of the ESI for conceptualizing and organizing this two-day event and acting as moderator for yesterday's panel. The, the Environmental Solutions Initiative is lucky to have Marcella leading the Natural Climate Solutions Program, and I'm really looking forward to our expansion in this area and the potential for working with partners around the world. And now I pass to you, Marcella. Thank you, John, and thank you, Diana. It was a real pleasure to hear diverse voices and perspectives on this topic over the last two days. 
And what I want to highlight from today's panel is that the close connection between urban areas with biodiversity is not only desirable in many places in the global south, but it is really the most viable development model. And there is much to be done to work in these regions and with these local communities as they create their own development models that are prosperous and sustainable. So at the MIT ESI, we look forward to continue to collaborate with the Humboldt Institute, with the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, and the researchers from academic institutions all around the world who have participated in this lecture series as we work to advance initiatives focused on biodiversity and cities. So thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs>